Hello, and welcome to the Inside of Views podcast for February the 14th, 2022. This is a midweek bonus episode on and the first of our infrastructure, infrastructure series. On today's show, we are pleased to be joined by Robert Morasso from Electrify America. His official title there is Senior Director, Sales, Business Development and Marketing. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EV's Forum Moderator and Inside EV's Editor. Joining us today is Tom Malogny, Inside EV's Editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have uh, Martin Lee from the EV News Daily, Sp- EV News Daily <laughs> Podcast joining us. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so before we get going, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to our channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that bell icon for notifications. If you're watching us on Twitch, you can also ring that bell icon for notifications. All right. So with that out of the way, welcome, everybody. Good morning. And uh, so today we're kicking off our, a series of midweek bonus podcasts centered on charging infrastructure. We'll be talking to people from different charging networks and utilities to get a sense of where we're at now and where we want to be in the future and what are the challenges and opportunities involved. Uh, Robert, as I mentioned in the introduction, you are the Senior Director of Sales, Business Development and Marketing at uh, Electrify America. I understand that you've been with them for like four years now, uh, having started as Director of Utility Strategy and Operations and have also had the role of uh, Chief Operating Officer for Electrify Canada. Uh, Previous to that, you were at EVgo and before that, you spent seven years with Aero Environment, which was... uh, one of the, really one of the biggest names, I think, in EV charging uh, back in the day, and has since had its uh, EV charging operations uh, by Wabasto. Uh, so suffice to say, when it comes to infra- uh, EV charging and infrastructure, uh, you have experience in this field that probably few can match. Uh, so start us off then by telling us uh, about Electrify America's story. Uh, a lot of a lot of people are aware that it was created using a, a two billion dollar Volkswagen. Uh, fund that they had to pay as part of the uh, diesel emission scandal settlement. Uh, but not many know that VW wasn't necessarily required to create a, like a national a charging network per se. So I don't know, tell us about the original v- vision of Electrify America and how it got to where it is today, the largest and probably best known network for charging electric vehicles that use the standard CCS plug. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm really happy to be here. Happy Monday, everyone. Um, so, you know, Electrify America started uh, roughly about four years ago, a little bit, a little bit more than that. Um, and, and really, it was an investment that Volkswagen made a commitment to, to, to invest $2 billion over a 10-year period, really trying to find the kind of infrastructure that's going to push uh, zero emission vehicle adoption along, right? And so when we started this mission, we kind of looked at, okay, what, what, are, what are consumers want? What do, what do automakers need? what's in their roadmap in terms of the types of vehicles that they're going to deploy. So obviously the first thing we saw was battery electric vehicles were, were the dominant player in terms of investments that were being made by automakers and really the sort of the key technology that w- was going to drive the zero emission vehicle uh, movement forward. And so from there, then we started talking to consumers in terms of what are their pain points and what is keeping them from getting into an electric vehicle. And the biggest thing was range confidence, obviously, being able to drive anywhere just like in your gas powered vehicle Um, but also being able to do that quickly right so everybody always has the the five minute 10 minute mark of uh, filling up your your gas tank and and uses that as a comparison of of what they want to see when they get into an electric vehicle so we knew we needed to build a ubiquitous network of infrastructure that was everywhere and anywhere but that it was built for speed. And when we talked to the automakers at that time, we also knew that they were building for speed. So several of the automakers were pushing 150 kilowatts. We saw Porsche that was pushing well above 200 kilowatts of charging power. So that was an important segment for us to understand what we needed to develop for, for the infrastructure, because we just didn't want it to serve the cars you know, today or tomorrow. We wanted to serve the cars that are five, 10 years down the road. And if we're going to put this amount of infrastructure in, in terms of utility power and other things, we wanted to make sure we built for the right for the right kind of equipment. And so, you know, that led us to to help incentivize the, the uh, development of of the high power charging, ultra fast charging um, chargers that we've deployed today at 150 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt. And so that entailed, you know, us having to go in and uh, work with the connector manufacturers to develop 
liquid cool cable because nobody was talking about those power levels. And when we started talking about this, you know, four years ago, people thought we were crazy. Um, like there's no way you're going to destroy the grid. Everything's just, you know, we're going to have blackouts left and right. Um, this is insane. And, uh, and, but, but we kept on it. We developed the technology with our partners uh, and we started to deploy that technology. And today we have, you know, over 800 stations across the country. We opened our first one. The you know, first station was at the middle of 2018. So just a, a short time ago. And now we have over 800 stations across the, uh, across the country, uh, over 3000 individual chargers, all 150 kilowatt and above. Uh, and that's and, and so we really wanted to bring that ubiquitous charging across the country. We wanted to bring that ultra fast charging and we wanted to bring consistency to the consumer. Right. So no matter where, whether you're in Florida, or you're in New Jersey, California, it doesn't matter. The experience is the same. You're going to go into the same kind of type of location. Uh, the look and feel of the charge is the same. The way you pay for a charge is the same. And it's all really trying to drive that confidence, right? Giving that consistency, that availability, that high speed charging, you always know what you're going to get in terms of power. Um, that's really made the difference and that's where we focused. And, and so it's been a good run so far and, and we're, we're still on track. You know, while we made in Volkswagen did commit that $2 billion, we just announced uh, last year our boost plan. Uh, so essentially almost doubling down on our initial investment. Uh, so by the end of 2025, we're headed to 10,000 chargers uh, across the country and, and you know, uh, thousands of sites. So um, we're, we're, we're building big, we're in, we're committed, and, and we're doing this in a sustainable way. That was one of the key things that we wanted to make sure when we built Electrify America is that we're building a sustainable business. We knew the early days are tough, right? And that's why we exist, so that we can help build that infrastructure to gain the momentum, gain the adoption rates, help, help speed, spur that along um, but what now as we get to the years ahead we want to make sure that this infrastructure has a sustainable business model that it can go forward and so that's that's how we built electrify america it, it's uh not only going to spur and is spurring the adoption um but it's something that's going to continue on as the, as the years go by right so the four years that's not very that's not really very long at all that to get where you are now from like zero to 800 uh, is that eight, uh, 800 chargers at how many locations? Uh, that's at over, so it's 800 locations now um, okay. that we're out. And then okay. just roughly over 3,000 chargers. That's right, right. All right. Uh, so there are a number of different charging networks in the U.S. now uh, with more on the way. Uh, what do you expect Electrify America's market position to be in the future, ex especially after the, the, the initial funding sort of dries up? Uh, like, Charging networks, as you know, are hugely capital intensive to roll out. So do you see profitability on the horizon uh, as a way to continue expansion of the electrification of trans as electrification of transport grows? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 how we built the business. Uh, so, you know, we look at this out of, over a very long time period, uh, well over 10 years. Um, and there's a certain adoption curve that, that we see, right? And so obviously a lot of that is uh, a bit of a crystal ball as, as you kind of look to the future in terms of what that consumer adoption is going to be and, you know, what what sort of climate we just live in, right, overall, uh, both from a federal and local level. But, but you know, the business has really built been built on how do we build that sustainable model. And so, um, but the luxury we have is that we have patience, right? We've got that patience to get through the early years so that we can get to that critical, that critical stage. But yeah, the, the infrastructure will be self-sustaining uh, and to a point where it can continue to grow, right? Uh, and, and I think you'll see that just overall in the space as more and more vehicles, uh, you know, become uh, a major component of the overall, um, you know, units that are in operation, right? And as we transition from gas to electric, uh, you'll see you'll see more and more uh, other networks start to pop up. In terms of Electrify America, I, I think we'll, what we're really proud of is is the momentum we've been able to drive, right? And the attention we've been able to drive, and really trying to really focus on the things that customers really want. Like I said, you know, we really focused on this 150 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt ultra fast charging because that really is the difference. I mean, there's there's when you're doing a road trip and and you can do 200 kilowatts or 150 kilowatts and you're only there for 10 or 20 minutes and you're going on your next 200 or 300 miles. Um, that's a game changer, right? You're like, wow, I can really do this. I can do this all electric, um, and you can you can abandon your gas car. And so that's really what we push for. And like I said in the early days, everyone thought we were crazy we were going you know above 100 kilowatts. But now you know we just saw the federal the the federal guidance come out 
uh, you know, for the for their uh, for the Biden's investment infrastructure mm-hmm. investment. And you see there they're wanting 150 kilowatt or above. Right. So people have finally understood this is what's needed to push the momentum forward. You see others now starting to install the high power charging, the ultra fast charging um, like we are doing. And so, you know, we're really happy that we've been in the space to help drive the momentum to where we need to go. Right on. Hey, Tom, did you want to take a question? Yeah, let me grab a question. I'm actually going to have Martin pull one up from the, the comments that sure. Buddy made at 10.07, Martin. So okay. Buddy asked, you know, why don't cars and chargers have, uh, why don't uh, cars and chargers standardized modules? Why don't they have standardized modules so that there'd be a, a, a seamless handshake? Now, one of the things that, that I have noticed is sometimes when new electric vehicles come to the market, we get the cars first before the public. I have all kind of trouble plugging in and charging them. There always seems to be communication problems. And I've talked to people at Electrify America and other networks, and this isn't a problem unique to, to Electrify America. But what happens is the if the automaker hasn't given you the vehicle for a couple of months to do thorough testing in your labs, there there always seems to be little glitches. And um, I, I'm uh, along with our followers don't understand why that happens like isn't there a ccs standard and if the car manufacturer follows it and you follow it there should be no problems we plug it in and it just works but that's not the case could you talk a little bit about that problem and as i said it's not um specific to electrify america but it's it's an issue that people with new cars seem to go over and over again every time a new electric car comes to the market it takes a couple of months before the it works on all the charging uh different networks yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, one that we work on day in day out at Electrify America. Yeah, so there is the CCS standard, right? And and standards, you know, can, they can always be interpreted in many different ways. And so that's that's really what you what you start to see is you see a lot of different players coming in um, now, starting to interpret that standard and being able to, to develop their vehicles. And then there's a point where you need to make sure that the interoperability with the the hardware the network as well as the vehicle is there. Look, I've, I've been, you know, in early in my career, I used to make uh, fast chargers. Uh, back then we were doing the Chatamo standard. Um, and there was really only two Chatamo cars in the early days. It was the Mitsubishi iMeve and, and the <laughs> Nissan Leaf. And, and even between those two cars, the way they interpreted the standard was was different. And so then uh-huh. we had to sit there and work with each one to make it work. And finally the iMeve went away and it was only the Nissan Leaf. So it was kind of like, okay, well, it always works with this one. So that one's a little bit easier. But on the CCS now, right, you've got a ton of vehicles coming out. Yeah. And so uh, every automaker, right, they're getting in for the first time, they're developing the standard, they're developing how it's going to work on their vehicle. Um, and so they're trying to learn how this how this all works. You have the charger makers who obviously have some experience. And so a lot of times what will happen is the manufacturer or the, or the auto ODM will test with the, directly with the, the charger maker and will test with two or three and they think, okay, everything works, everything's great. But then they forget about, oh, there's there's actually a customer in the middle of this, right? And there's a payment system in the middle of this, right? So there's a lot of different variables that come into play when you're actually out in the wild and somebody has to pull up, grab a, grab a cord, plug it in, either swipe a credit card, swipe your app, or hit an, an RFID card. There's things that happen, right? And there's delays that happen and other things that, that go on. And we realized this early on. So one of the things that we did is uh, we knew we needed to bring a, everyone together Right, and we needed to own the op- we need we need to own the problem. Right, it's not the automaker's problem, it's not the charger maker's problem, it's not some network's problem, it's our problem, and we've got to figure it out. And so, what we did is we built our center of excellence in Reston, Virginia, basically where we have every type of uh, uh, charger that we have uh, installed in the field uh, in our lab, whether it's the Canadian version or the U.S. version, it doesn't matter. We have it all in our lab. Uh, and we actually lease a whole fleet of vehicles. Um, so we have a, a continuous rotation of, of every type of EV in, in the market uh, in our lease fleet. Uh, and then we also invite automakers to come in when they're developing vehicles to, to, help, to help them test, right? And, and go through all these different nuances. We use a few different vendors of, many, of hardware. Plus we have a network system. Uh, that has to all come together and work seamlessly when when a customer um, goes to a charging station. So we work with them to kind of work out those kinks. 
Um, some have been hes were hesitant early on, and and now what we see is everyone's calling, right? I've got a car, I've got a cup test, or we've we've got some um, new data. We want to come back and, and test some more. And it's really what we've done is really we've come in and taken ownership of the problem. Um, and it hasn't been easy and it hasn't been perfect, but you really got to work through all those different nuances and all those different variables that you go up uh, and, and find where the weak points are, right? A standard was developed, but it, it doesn't have the traction or, the, or sort of the experience, I would say, in, in the marketplace. And now we're starting to get that. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of, you know, there's maybe some deficiencies in the standard or there could be some improvements in the standard here or there, right? There could be better ways we can maybe try do retries or, um, you know, do timeouts a little bit differently. There's all these different things that we're learning together with the automakers, with the charger makers, uh, all focused around the standard and then figuring out what, can, what we can do to improve. I think the challenge, one of the challenges for us is we just can't do one change for one auto manufacturer, right? Because if we make one change for one auto manufacturer, we could ruin, you know, how it all happens for the rest of the automakers. So we have to be very careful on any changes we make, uh, be very thoughtful about those changes, go back and regression test against all the other vehicles and uh, makes and models to make sure that we're we're, we're staying, um, you know, true to all all the different vehicles, and so it's it's a tricky problem, but one that we've you know we've taken ownership of it. We know we're not perfect yet, but you know where we were three years ago to where we are today is is phenomenal, and where we're going to be, you know, just a few months from now, and just the acceleration of the improvement of the standard and, and how this integration all works is is getting better and better by the day. So we're really excited about that, and I think that's one of the big contributions Electrify America has made to this to this industry is being able to sort of bring all parties together uh, and, and improve how the system works, right? How the standard works. Because when we make improvements and tweak this or that, the, the automaker is making that change to the car that then improves how it works with all the other chargers that are out there, right? Or we make a change uh, to a particular charger. Others are buying that technology. So it's going to improve what others buy and deploy in that technology. So just the just you know that's really what I'm proud of and, and really proud for for everyone that works in our NOC and our network operations center as well as our in our engineering lab, you know, mm -hmm. just the work that they've been able to do to help push the industry forward and make EV adoption even easier. Can I ask one about expandability? Uh, just to use an example from over here in the UK, uh, there's a network uh, called GridServe, and they bought the probably the original national network that we had maybe 10 years ago. So they inherited some very, very old hardware. A lot of it sponsored by Nissan back in the day. And uh, I remember the first time I used one of their wonderful new ABB units, and I plugged my car in, and it's charging at either 50 or 70 kilowatts. And it says 125 on the top. And I'm like, oh, this is dri and driving me crazy. And I go look at the side of the sticker on the side of that that unit, um, and it says 150 amp. And I feel like such a dummy because I'm realizing, oh well, of course, because they 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 within like three months they put loads of new hardware into that network. But what they couldn't do so as quick as as, as and they are improving was make the experience better beyond the grid connection that they had. And I'm like, well, it's great, the hardware's brilliant, but I'm still charging really slowly. And I started to think about the challenges that, that network operators have, not just in that the bit that I interface with the hardware, but go back to the grid. And it's a really complex problem. Do existing sites for you guys have any ability uh, for adding charges as demand increases? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's a site specific type of situation, right? So many times the utility won't let you have a tremendous amount of power, right? If you're only going to put in four or six stalls, they're not going to let you put in, you know, and you might expand five, 10 years from now to, to 20 stalls. They may not put in all that power and that you're going to need five or 10 years down the road. Uh, some utilities will. So on the utility side, depending on, you know, what that utility will allow and how much, you know, um, extra capacity they'll let us reserve for, for future expansion uh, is a case by case basis. But downstream from the utility, from that transformer, we certainly do build for expansion in mind. And so, um, so you see that in a lot of the large equipment pads we put out. Um, sometimes there's extra space, um, and there's extra stalls. Sometimes we'll run the conduit, and sometimes it's just in the underlying lease agreement that we that we secure from the mm -hmm. property owner that allows us to then expand, and we can come out and construct 
uh, and add more more uh, more stalls in. The other thing we're working on, and and you'll see that coming out later this year, is you know we're working on what can we do from an equipment perspective, and and how can we make that more compact, more streamlined, so that we can put more infrastructure in for the same amount of space. So that's something that we're looking at very closely, and and we'll be we'll be sharing some news here later this year. That's that's pretty exciting. That that's going to push our network even further. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we, we've had a lot of uh, comments asking, uh, when are you going to put uh, some chargers in this location or that location or, you know, um, on the rest stops along in some certain states allow rest stops on, on the medians there. Uh, so, uh, so how do you select station locations overall? Like what are the priorities in terms of amenities and the proximity to major roads, uh, utility hookup access and, and all that? No, great question. And I think when, when we looked at, and we look at this, you know, depends on the kind of the geography and, and what um, uh, you know, sort of use case we're, we're, we're trying to achieve. So when you look at sort of the interstate highway or the cross country or the long distance travel, right, we want to be located along the interstates um, and, and highways, right? Uh, and typically we like to be right off the exit, you know, within a mile uh, or less of, of where that exits, sometimes two miles, depending on just what, um, you know, what amenities are available or what real estate and what power is available. Right. Uh, so, so generally, you know, along the interstates, very close to the roads uh, so that you're not having to travel far. When we get into the metros, you know, we are looking at the highway systems that do work through the metro areas, but we also look at the the communities uh, as a whole, right? You know, what is it a suburban kind of community? Is it multifamily? Uh, you know, what kind of demographics and other things and what kind of infrastructure is needed to kind of meet the need, right? Because one of the things that we see, especially in the metro areas, is, you know, while while this ultra fast charging really has its application, especially early on to help drive that, that distance traveling, right? But it's going to allow a whole, as you bring this into the community, it allows a whole different segment of people who rent, uh, or, you know, have multiple cars in a home and can't charge overnight, don't have a dedicated to charge or a place to charge or don't have a, a workplace charger, it's going to allow them to be able to get into an EV, right? So building this into the communities is very important so that can service all Americans uh, and Canadians, not just, you know, a, a specific demographic. So, uh, so that's kind of how we kind of pick and choose. Uh, it really depends on, you know, the, the application we're going after in the community. Uh, the next thing we look at is, you know, where do we want to co-locate with, right? And and we always want to co-locate with some sort of amenity, whether it's a restaurant, a coffee shop, uh, some sort of shopping, um, and and those types of things. So that's what we're always looking out for. So we have, you know, great uh, hosts like, you know, Simon Properties runs large malls, Westfield that runs large malls, uh, Targets, uh, the Albertsons, grocery stores, you know, all sorts of different types of, of, uh, of retail that we like to co-locate with. And that's typically where you'll see us. Um, and then when we're on the location, obviously, there's a lot of other factors that we look at. We look at safety, you know, what type of lighting is at the location? Um, are our drivers going to feel secure? What can we do to improve the, the, the area and those, and those uh, unique things? Or if it's just not a safe area that we don't feel comfortable with, we'll forego that location and, and look for another site. Uh, but we'll also look at measures that we can do, improve lighting and things like that to, to help consumers. And then we, would, we do want to make sure that it's within close proximity to, to the uh, actual retail itself. Uh, and there's good you know, ingress and, and, and you can get in and out very quickly. Uh, is another factor because some some customers just want to get in and charge or some customers want to get in and do a little bit of shopping or, or grab a coffee so we kind of try to balance both and then the other critical factor is where's the power coming in from right you have to really balance where that where that's coming in because if the utility says well the power is here and now i have to trench clear across the parking lot right to get to the other side right there's a there's an expense to that that we try to mitigate uh, and so there's a bit of a balancing act in terms of, you know, trying to, you know, meet the needs of, of all these different variables uh, and, and get to, to an adequate spot on the actual location itself. Right. Rob, a uh, question. I have a uh, Ford F-150 Lightning coming in a couple of months, and uh, I may need to pull a trailer every now and then. And that's an issue with uh, the way charging stations are currently configured. Uh, you know, EV pickup trucks are coming, a lot of them. And um, how, uh, what are you, how are you planning to deal with um, allowing the trucks to 
be able to plug in because unfortunately when you're pulling a trailer you need to plug in even more frequently than when you're not so you know a long trip might turn into four or five stops whereas if you weren't pulling a trailer you might be able to do it with one stop so how, how do you deal with that and and are you planning on making accommodations for trucks that are pulling trailers yeah no absolutely it's a great question we get that quite a bit uh, and we've been doing a lot of work internally to kind of uh, assess that that issue and and figuring out how we can accommodate uh, trucks with trailers uh, because they are coming. They're coming very soon. And, uh, and, you know, already we see quite a few trucks with trailers hitting us. We actually see a lot of semi trucks, uh, large class A trucks also go into our locations and, and trying to charge in large coach buses and, and all sorts of different things, uh, which is pretty exciting to see. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing is, is reevaluating our site templates and our site design uh, and seeing how we can, um, you know, draw up our, our sites a little bit differently to better handle these these locations. And so I think you're going to see as we go into this year and next year, you'll see several sites now uh, being able to accommodate the, the through pull, uh, the pull through type of style hmm. or just trucks with trailers and making it uh, a little bit easier for those types of customers. Um, it is a challenging aspect, right? Uh, you, you know, you're dealing with real estate. Real estate, you know, um, is is not cheap, and and so when you're taking up a lot of space, uh, it gets to be a, a little bit difficult. It's a little bit easier, I think, on on the interstate highways, and so that's one of the areas we're focusing on quite a bit as we build uh, a lot of new new locations. Um, you know, we're building the upper Midwest uh, portion through you know Montana and the Dakotas and other areas. We're filling in that gap. Up in up in that area because now we see trucks coming and and we want to make sure we have the right kind of infrastructure for for that uh, for truck country especially um, so I think you'll start to see uh, some of those sites and then we'll, we'll do a little bit more on our on our um, on our data that we uh, provide our customers to let them know the the type of location to expect uh, so you'll be able to see if I have a truck with a trailer what kind of sites um, uh, are available or are easier to to get in and help you kind of decide your route on the network based on those dynamics. Okay. Yeah. I would imagine you need to have some sort of pull through stalls. Um, right. You know, otherwise right. it's just going to be, a, you're going to have a truck blocking your entire station, you know, parked yep. parallel to the curb and, you know, 10 other EVs just waiting for him to unplug so they can plug in. So hopefully that's, um, you know, you're, 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 you're going to be moving on that pretty quickly because these trucks are coming. Absolutely. Yeah, we're excited to. And, and you will see it. You'll see it start to come. Um, yeah, and, and exactly right. The, the pull through style tends to be the, the simplest and easiest solution to the whole thing. So it's it's more of, you know, how can you fit as many of these as possible uh, to string along an adequate route to, to be able to get to get you where you want to go? Uh, see, I have a, a question. Um, agreements with uh, automakers are, are key to charging network success. As, as well as moving the friction points and making the fast charging experience easier than a traditional fuel pump. So how are you no, no, negotiating these multi-year contracts with automakers? And are, are they pushing for the ISO 15118 standard, which makes plug and charge possible? And also, can you speak to why it's taking Volkswagen, which I, it's assumed you have a close relationship or a closer relationship than others, longer to roll out plug and charge than other automakers, if you have any insight into that? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, let me talk about the automaker agreements. Look, I, sure. the automakers understand that, you know, driving that range confidence to their customers is extremely important, right? And, you know, given, given the customer the, the answer they need in terms of if I'm going to get in this vehicle, can I go on vacation, right? Can I go to my destination routes? Uh, can I do everything I, I normally would with my electric vehicle? And so making sure that that's integrated into the bike and experience so they can answer that question is extremely important. And that's why, you know, we've worked so closely and so well with so many different auto automakers because we're able to provide them that, that confidence factor that they need when they want to put the bundle this with their vehicle. And every automaker kind of bundles a, a sort of a different package in terms of what they need for their specific customer. Um, and, and we see a lot of success. And And really the great thing is, you know, when it's included with the vehicle, it, it kind of encourages you just to go try it, right? It's there, it doesn't cost you anything, go give it a shot. And and I think once people do that, they understand, oh, this is really simple, oh, this is pretty fast. Hey, well, I think we 
you do this, I'm going to take this car for my next road trip. And then, and then it just snowballs from there. Right. Cause now they, they see like, Oh, I could do this. And they're talking to other people and, and, and spreading the word, right. And helping drive adoption. So it's a very critical point. And that's why we've really focused on, on making sure that we can integrate the service with the vehicle um, to, to drive that confidence, to drive that experience. Uh, and, 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 you know, overall, I think it's, it's been very successful and it really drives us, you know, and the automaker, to work closely together to make sure that customer because now we have we have a vested interest it's it's both our customer right we want to make sure that it's a perfect experience and and so it gets us in the lab it gets us working together it gets us working out the, all those little kinks so that we can make sure that customer experience is is as perfect as possible and then you know we worked with a lot of makers that wanted to go a step further right uh, like with with ford porsche lucid uh, and others on on integrating the the plug-in charge that's built on the ISO 15118 standard, and and really we're the we're the only ones in the U.S. today doing this and, and able to offer this service. But you know driving that customer experience even to the to the level further where you don't have to take out an app, you don't have to look on your heads up display, you just get out, plug in the chart the the car, the vehicle already knows who it is. It tells the charger I'm so and so. We can authorize that that transaction. And the, and the and the and the charging happens in a in a safe and secure manner, and and you know that's really been a, a very a big plus uh, point for us as well as the industry, right? The, like how simple this could really be, and uh, and so other automakers have been very excited. I can't comment on exactly when Volkswagen or any of the other brands will will come out with uh, with the standard, um, but uh, but certainly I think everyone is well aware making this customer experience seamless and flawless is, is extremely important. It's critical, whether you're using an app, whether you're using plug and charge, whatever it may be, when you plug in that first time, we've got to make sure that charge happens and, and meet that customer expectation. And that's really the, I think the, the, the great thing that we've been able to do is, is take ownership of that problem, work with all the different parties and really drive that forward. Great, let me, let me follow up really quickly, not with a question. But we, I've seen a bunch of comments from people asking, when is the ID4 going to get uh, plug and charge? Uh, Michael just asked, when is uh, when are any vehicles beyond the Taycan going to get plug and charge? That's not Rob's uh, you know responsibility. Electrify America and Electrify Canada have initiated plug and charge on their network. The automakers have to put it in their cars. The the the, the network's ready for it, so you know they've done their part. Now the OEMs have to enable it on their cars. There's nothing Electro America has to do about it at this point. It's, 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 they're the only network that has it enabled across their network. Okay, yeah. my rant's over. Okay, <laughs> like, I'd like yeah, to, right. if, I, if I can jump in, Dom, Dom got a two-parter question, so I'd like, I'd like to ask a two-parter question in, in that case. Um, <laughs> can we talk about solar and storage? It's, it's, you know, really interesting. I charged yesterday, we had a downpour in the UK, surprise, surprise, it's February. Of course, it's gray and raining. And I got absolutely drenched and I was cursing there being no canopy. And of course, if there's a canopy, you might as well put solar panels on it, even though the difference they make is negligible. But it, I don't know, it looks good, like you're generating something from solar. Um, but I think it is important as well for the general perception of using renewable energy. So can you, can you comment on how many of your sites might add solar, perhaps in the next couple of years till the middle of the decade? And in combination with that, energy storage as well to mitigate demand charges. Now, Electrify America, um, I think something like 30 megawatt hours of battery storage at 140 odd sites. It was your recent announcement about 214 kilowatt hours on average per site. Are you also aiming for more energy storage on all sites? And again, if the answer is yes, at what kind of level? Yeah, no, fantastic question. I, let's, let's start on the canopies first. You know, when we really launched, you know, we'd love to do canopies right away, but we 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 were sort of under time pressure to get infrastructure out, and that's really where we focused on the U.S. side primarily. Um, and you know, when it comes to canopies and things like that, the, the permitting process sometimes can take you for a loop, and you got to go through some extra extra channels and other other sort of wickets to to get to your final uh, design and, and installation. So. Uh, we held off on that on the U.S. side for for some time, um, but in Canada, we knew um, from an experience standpoint, obviously, <laughs> having to, the amount of snow up, up in Canada, we we had to take care of problem right away. So that's one where we we focused on putting in those early, uh, and it, and it kind of acted as a bit of a 
I would say almost like a prototype or, or a, 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 an experiment to see, you know, how well do they work? What's the customer feedback? What are the benefits? Kind of working through some of these permitting issues and things like that. And what we found is, you know, for all intents and purposes, if we keep them reasonably sized, uh, so they're not, you know, super huge, um, that we can get them through permitting fairly quickly. And the customer benefit has just been phenomenal. Uh, and, and the feedback we've gotten on the in the Canadian side, uh, no other network up there or the charger man manufacturers really doing that uh, at their chargers. Uh, and so we really stand differentiated, I think, from an overall customer experience and being able to just provide that certain amount of shelter uh, for the customer as they plug in their vehicle, right? So they don't get drenched or, or full of snow. Um, as they're charging. And so we've really taken that back here in the United States. And we announced at the LA Auto Show that we're going to be installing, installing something similar to what we did in Canada. But the big difference is we're going to actually put some solar um, on, on top of those panels. And so you, we're, you're going to see those start to roll out this year. Uh, the plan is to go to as many of our sites, existing sites as we can and install uh, these canopies, especially a lot of the, the, you know, the heavy sun areas as we look through a lot of the Southwest, right? As you get to these chargers, the, you know, not only does it help with the equipment life, but also as you touch a connector, you don't want some burning uh, connector, right? Mm -hmm. Just from the, from the, from the sun load, um, but as well as in sort of the Northern climates, right? The, the kind of providing the shelter that we've, we've done in, in, in Canada. Uh, and the solar really, you know, it, it doesn't generate a whole lot of power, but we'll have uh, lighting uh, fixtures on the site. So the, the solar will provide, all the the energy need to provide the lights at night. So we under the canopies we have great LED lights that provide a lot of lighting for the area. And again, it provides even that more sense of security for customers as they go to charge. So that's very important. So more to come on that uh, in terms of all our locations. But we built big, large uh, what we call our mega sites. Uh, and our first one was in Baker, California, right in between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, uh, where we built a large solar system. Um, that's that's grid tied and uh, provides quite a bit of energy uh, that helps offset our energy expense. And uh, we've done that in, at Valley Fair up in Santa Clara, California. And you're going to see more and more of those pop up in some of these key metro areas, uh, large, large format, large solar panels. Uh, and so that's very exciting to see. The, the other thing that you started talking about is our battery storage. Right. So one of the big, big problems and big hurdles for us uh, and, and any I would say um, anybody who operates and pays utility on, on DC on DC fast chargers mm -hmm. is uh, demand charges, right from the utility. So this is, you know, it doesn't matter how many people charge. If one person comes and charges, you sort of if they pull 150 kilowatts, you get this multiplier on your bill that's very expensive. And so one of the ways to mitigate that is you put some energy storage on your site. Basically, the storage helps absorb. That, that load and avoids that utility bill that you would normally see. And so that was a very important point for us to, to try to tackle is demand charges. Um, and we do this through a variety of different ways, but one of them was through technology. And so we've, we've procured uh, hundreds of um, battery storage systems that, that you mentioned and started deploying those. We're well over 120 of those sites now operational. Uh, we're gonna you know, put in probably uh, over 200 sites here shortly. Uh, and and uh, it, it, they're all they're all spread out throughout the country, and it's really driven primarily through the economics, um, through the, the utility demand charge. But the benefit that provides is, um, you know, we're able to mitigate the demand. Uh, but then, in, in a lot of the sites in California, we're actually aggregating those assets together. So we take all our energy storage systems and we make it look like one big um, generation facility. If you think about oh, it that wow. way. And so we're we're actually now uh, offering those on the wholesale market. So we we uh, do bid into the Kaiso market, into the California ISO, and are able to to now achieve an additional revenue stream with all these assets in the ground. So there's there's a lot of things that we're sort of you know demand charges is the primary driver, but now we can do a lot of other things that provide our auxiliary you know ancillary uh, revenue. Um, uh, sources for us that, that make it pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we're using batteries and we're doing this in Baker, California, which is pretty exciting is we're using it for an application called what we call non-wires alternative. So at Baker, we were li really limited by the utility in terms of how much power was available to put in infrastructure. I think we had about 600 kilowatts of power remaining at Baker. And it was going to take the utility another two to three years to basically bring in new wire to bring in more capacity. And so we needed to figure out a way 
we wanted to put a lot of 350 kilowatt chargers, right? Think about the traffic from LA to Vegas, right? Yeah, it's a big group. <laughs> happy going on Thursdays and everyone's really sad coming back on Sunday night. <laughs> Vegas. And so we need to make sure we, we could take care of their need and what they, what they need. So, you know, we weren't going to get the power. So what we did is we actually procured megawatt size uh, battery storage and we placed that at the site. So it's acting as a buffer. So we trickle charge all day long, plus the solar that we have on the canopies that's charging the batteries. And when everybody comes to charge and they're, you know, the site is pushing more than 600 kilowatts, we're able to, to use the battery to offset the remaining power and still deliver the experience that customers need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we use, we use the battery systems for a lot of different things and it offers us a lot of flexibility. But at the end of the day, the reason we're doing this is because we want to provide consistency to the customer. When you go to one of our chargers, you want 150 kilowatts, you want 350 kilowatts. I can't sit there and say, well, you know, the grid's going through a moment right now, so you're only going to get 20 kilowatts, so you're going to yeah. sit for a few hours, right? You don't want that as a customer. And so that consistency is extremely important. This is what this technology allows us to do. Hmm. And that's where, you know, that's how we think about the problem. What does the consumer expect? How do we make this seamless? How do we drive that confidence? And what technologies, what things do we need to do to make that happen? And that's how that's how we work as a company. Hmm. Nice. Um, so, how how key is that uh, revenue stream from uh, bidding into the market using your your installed uh, battery capacity? How key is that for, in helping you reach uh, profitability in the future? Uh, it's. It, we're not banking on that amount um, on that revenue to make it make us a profitable company, right? Okay. It's it's uh, right now it's it's sort of another way to generate some revenue, just like you know we could do some advertising on the screen or uh, other schemes, uh, working with some of our partners to drive uh, additional revenue. So that's just a, a a portion and some future opportunity as as we look to to see how the market develops. There's a lot of things that have to develop in the overall, I would say, wholesale market uh, to be able to allow distributed resources to uh, provide more and more services. Uh, and so, um, you know, those markets have to evolve and they're different. You know, California ISO is one market. You have PJM. There's a lot of different markets across the country. Uh, so, you know, depending on how those rules develop in terms of, uh, you know, utilizing distributed assets to be able to, to provide services. Uh, remains to be seen. Okay. So uh, reliability is like a huge issue for electric vehicle buyers. Uh, Tesla is perceived to have like near perfect reliability while other networks have had issues. Uh, obviously it's easier for them right now, uh, Tesla, since they supply the vehicles, the charging equipment and the software that controls the entire process. Well, others like, like Electrify America use charging equipment, equipment from uh, a number of suppliers uh, that have to work across a variety of platforms from different automakers that have slightly different softwares. Uh, so reliability has seen huge improvements over the past couple of years, but there are, are but what are the main issues that still arise for networks and, and how is Electrify America trying to resolve them to create the experience that EV owner that will give EV owners like total confidence? No, it's, it's a great question. You know, reliability is, is, is paramount. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when a charger, when someone goes up to charge, it's got to work. It's got to work the first time, right? And that's that's the metric. That's the goal we try to set ourselves up, right? No one's perfect, right? No right. one's near perfect. I think that's a, a pretty high high thing. And you know, I'll challenge any stats that, that people want to bring to the table. But you know, I think we're all after the same thing, right? Is is how do you get that that perfect experience when the customer comes um, comes to the door and and wants to charge? So you know, that's why we built the center of excellence. Um, you know, when we started out, we did we scoured the market to see, okay, who who are the best charger manufacturers? Who's the best providers? Let's let's go through a competitive process to really see who we can you know partner with to to move forward. We chose four manufacturers when we started. One was because we, obviously we wanted to make sure we had the right partners, but also to just the sheer volume of equipment and other things that we were going to need. Not one company could produce everything we we needed. Um, and um, but we knew we needed to build some controls and make sure that we can validate 
and and make sure we can control the experience and that's why we built that center of excellence lab and and so it's it's taken some time and we've been working through all the kinks and everything else that that come along with you know owning and operating an infrastructure um and and so from a from an equipment standpoint you know we, we've done you know leaps and bounds from where we were three years ago now the equipment is 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 getting to a, a fairly reliable standard uh, I would say overall, we want to see better improvements and we're driving our suppliers uh, to, to, to have that better improvement. And one of the, 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 the cool things is, you know, uh, and we'll probably, you'll probably ask me about utilization. You know, we're doing tens of thousands of charging sessions now every week. Um, and so that's a tremendous amount of data that we're getting. And we're, we're monitoring every single success and failure. And on the failure points, we're really you know, working to figure out what happened, what was wrong with that session. And then, then we kind of collect, okay, it's, is it a trend? What's the trend we're seeing? And then we can sometimes get down, you know, there's a, maybe it's a car thing or, or it's a charger thing. And then we could Pareto out exactly, okay, here, Mr. Manufacturer, here's the thing you have to work on. You've got to fix this problem. And so we're able to drive their engineering resources to really focus on the things they need to fix. Um, and so that's, that's a great thing from that part. The other part is, you know, we've built a, a, a nationwide network and we've got to be able to go out and repair every single station, no matter what happens. If a screen goes bad, if a button goes bad, if a connector breaks, whatever it is, or if something happens where it's an unsafe condition, we need to be out there within hours to, to make sure we put things in a safe condition. So we built out this national North American network, basically, of technicians, trained technicians across the country. They're able to service and support our equipment. And that, and with that comes a whole, you know, part stocking, right? We need to make sure we have yeah. every part available uh, on, on a day's notice, right? So we can overnight parts or do whatever we need to, to fix things. Um, so, you know, we've built out this entire support network um, that's unprecedented really uh, for, a, for an open network like ours uh, and really driving the, the industry forward in terms of what's needed uh, to, to drive zero emission vehicle adoption. Rob, I'd like to follow up quickly on on that um, because network reliability obviously is paramount. You know, it, um, you know, nobody really has difficulty when they pull up to a gas station and getting gas. You know, everybody leaves with a with a full tank, and especially for people new to this industry. Um, and I spend a lot of time at charging stations as well. You know, I do a lot of char charging tests and recordings and so forth. So I get to see people all the time, and I I, some, I see their frustration when they can't initiate a charge or when they pull up in the station's down. Now, a lot of times the customer's doing the wrong thing and that's why they can't initiate the charge. Um, and I always help people out. But one of the things that I think would be enormously helpful and I would like to know your thoughts on this is, I've noticed when I've used and a station's been out on the, on the site that I'm there, it typically gets fixed pretty quickly. I think overall, I think you do a good job with that. But then I do notice there are occasionally stations that linger and don't get fixed for a while. And I always wondered, well, is there a part they can't get? Is there an ETA on that? We get a lot of people emailing us and I get people sending me Twitter messages. Hey, Tom, could you find out why this station in whatever? It's been out for three weeks now. This is ridiculous. Um, is there a way that you could maybe have an update in the app like to acknowledge, yes, we know this station isn't working. And um, it's on work order and, you know, we anticipate it coming up in three weeks. I think it would quiet people down because when stations linger and they don't get fixed for a while, I think people have this impression that maybe you either don't know about it or you don't care about it. <laughs> and I think if you could give people a little insight to say, yeah, we know station three at this site's not working. You know, we're, we're expecting March 1st. It should be up and operational. Any thought into that? Would you be able to do that somehow? But I think that would be a big step forward for you guys. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great suggestion, Todd, and something we've been we've been talking about internally. You know, one of the big things we've been working with is our suppliers, and and some suppliers are better than others in terms of uh, you know spare part stock, uh, to be quite frank. Um, and so that's an area that most of the supply chain across the world has been has been dealing with. And so, you know, we deal with those same issues. Uh, so some are better than others. And I think that's really what you're seeing at some sites is, you know, just the availability of some parts and being able to, to quickly address some issues. Because if I can tell you right now, uh, we're watching every session. We watch every single comment, no matter what channel it might come in through, whether it's YouTube, whether it's you, Tom, emailing us. Uh, or, or whatever it might be, or, to, you know, just any channel we're monitoring that we're capturing and opening cases as needed. 
uh, and if it's a repair to a station and we've got the part, we've got the systems in place to be able to repair that within, you know, within hours to days uh, for that matter. So, uh, you know, we've got the right systems. We have to continue to work with our suppliers uh, on a daily basis to help them improve in terms of what they're doing for our, our spare sp uh, stock supply um, uh, to, to make sure we can make this as reliable as possible. But certainly I'll, I'll take that, that comment back to see what we can do to improve that communication factor. And I think that's something that we're, we're really looking at internally is, is how do we provide that better uh, heads up or that upfront communication. Today, we we do um, we do send that signal when if, if a charger is down or if a station's down, uh, we send that signal to our automaker partners so they can put it up in the heads up heads up display. We do we do do some messaging within our own app. We send it to PlugShare so we can send data there. So wherever customers are getting their information, we're trying to meet them there. So uh, you know if the messaging can be more clear and other things, we'll certainly take a look at that and I'll take that back in, Tom. Thanks. Yeah, I think it'd be an enormous help if people had some kind of an idea that of a time frame, you know, and, and if it's a sp specific part that's going to take a while, I think people would be forgiving if, you know, you said, you know, ETAs in three weeks, you know, part supply issue. But when it lingers and people don't know, they get frustrated because they think you don't care. And I know right. we know we know that's not the case. We talk to you guys all the time, but it does give that impression that, you know, hey, well, you know, there's three other chargers at that site that work. You know, you don't need the fourth one. And uh, yeah. that's not the case. Yeah, no, let's just say that this whole notion that Electrify America does, doesn't does care, I'll, you know, that's the one thing I'll take quite an uh, exception to. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you, we've got dozens of people on staff that are working day in, day out, 24 seven to monitor the network, to see where things are happening, to see where things are, aren't happening well and, and doing the things to fix it. The amount of hours that our engineers spend in the lab trying to work through, replicate experiences people have, our doc center that's looking through, I can't tell you the logs and logs of individual data. This The car sent this message, we sent this message, this happened here, trying to suss out what are the deficiencies. Just the hours this team and staff has done has been amazing. And you know, it, it really goes to show the dedication of this team and what they've done for the industry. It's, it's absolutely amazing, right? Because everyone benefits from our learnings in the industry and it's just making it better and i know we've had some rough patches but we've gotten through them and we're in a really good spot net right now and it's going to be even better as we look to the future so this is continuing to be improved and that's because of the dedication to the folks on the electrified american team i can't be more proud to, to be part of this mm -hmm. organization i think you've done some pretty extraordinary taken some pretty extraordinary <laughs> steps too in some places i understand that you switched out like whole cabinets like in you know they had installed and re had them replaced just for you know for better reliability as well oh absolutely i mean uh you know i said we started out with four manufacturers but uh we 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 set the bar pretty high and if our manufacturers can't meet us from a from an engineering standpoint being able to drive continuous improvement in right. their equipment um you know we have to make hard decisions because ultimately you know that customer is gonna is gonna suffer right and that that confidence that reliability everything we're trying to drive into the market is going to suffer and so we've made the hard choices where we've got to rip out equipment and replace it with other equipment and right. we're not shy to do that right uh, because ultimately we're trying to drive to that goal of driving that confidence that reliability that customers expect and and so we need we we drive that down to all our suppliers to make sure that they they meet us where we need to we need to get them I hadn't even considered the supply chain issues with like spare parts for for charging cabinets, and it, it's you know even after two years of this and it's, and it's still happening. I went to a, a fast food yester place yesterday, and I couldn't get a spicy chicken sandwich. Like that's <laughs> that's what that's what? the only reason I was go. And then you're in the drive through and you can't God has you know, forsaken us. Spicy chicken sandwiches. <laughs> Don't need <laughs> to spicy chicken. <laughs> so, I mean, like these these things, shortages are, are like everywhere still after all this time. But uh, so one of our regular co-hosts, uh, Kyle Connor, is on, is on the chat. I believe he's in somewhere in, in cold Michigan right now. So he had a question: uh, What is e Electrify America doing to help prevent tampering? For example, anyone can walk to a station and hit stop charging. Uh, many stations in Europe require an F. Uh, RFID card to stop charging. Uh, any work in this area, and also, uh, you know, connected to that. Do you have cameras, or do you, will you have maybe a cameras network to kind of keep an eye on on things? Or is that 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. In turn, I'll just take on the camera question first. Um, we are putting cameras at several of our sites now uh, where we can monitor it and we'll continue to deploy that. Again, it's a, it's a site specific thing. Hosts and other, other regulations may not allow you to do that, but where we can put it in, we are putting it in and, and starting to monitor sites today. Uh, in terms of, you know, hitting stop, this is something we dealt with very early on. Um, you know, from our experience, it hasn't been that big of a lot of our experience just from the space. It hadn't been a big problem. Um, and the nuances with the CCS standard in terms of and then other failure points. Well, if if, if uh, your RFID card didn't work or this didn't work, how do you stop the charge? Can you stop it from the car? There was a lot of those unknowns still as 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 the uh, vehicles were being developed. So we kind of held back. Uh, so I, I say it's something that we can reevaluate and it'll look at if it becomes uh, more and more of a problem where we're seeing new nuisance stops where people are just walking by hitting stop. Uh, we haven't seen it a problem today, so I'd love to, you know, Kyle, please email us and let us know where you, you think this has been a problem. We'd love to look at it and, and kind of assess it. Can I, uh, can I ask uh, more of a human question? Actually, um, Robert, like I'm lucky this job puts me in front of CEOs and, you know, technicians, engineers from charging companies. I meet the human beings behind what you're trying to do. And what you're trying to do is essentially quite an emotional thing as well. I tried to charge recently on the way home. Again, not your, not your network. Obviously, I'm thousands of miles away. Uh, we have a three-year-old. My wife gets a little bit ang like range anxiety getting home with a low state of charge. And the charges wouldn't work. And, and even as someone, I've talked to the people who own these companies, and I still felt angry at that network. It's probably my car. Talking to you for this last hour, it's so clear to me how much you care and how you want this to be right. And we need it to be right, to decarbonize everything from transport and energy onwards. We have to do this. But also when people turn up to one of your stations and it doesn't work for whatever reason, it is very, very emotional. And people in a social media world aren't backwards about coming forwards now. And they'll say, you suck. Like <laughs> when you and your colleagues come to work in the morning, you're not robots. You, you witness this feedback sometimes. How do you as just someone to to see that negativity sometimes because electrify america kindly sponsored this podcast for 13 weeks last year helped us get us on the air and we had people say you guys suck you're taking money from them i was and it's like no that's not that's not the way it is like it, when we have a good experience we'll say it and when we've had a bad experience we'll talk about we you know so man people can be mean as well and and how do you how do you just get on and try and stay positive and and know that you're doing the right thing even through difficult times well, that is tough, right? So, you know, there is no uh, hiding from it. Uh, people let you know how they feel. But look, it, we all believe we, we're on a mission, right? And I think for every one of us who joins Electrify America, it's more than just about technology or anything else, right? It, we're very mission driven and trying to drive zero emission vehicle adoption. We're all, all extremely passionate about it. I'm very passionate about it. I grew up in, you know, South Central LA right off the 710, 105 freeway, big trucks, a lot of emission. My lung capacity is probably a lot lower than all your lung capacity from where I grew up. I used to go hiking in the mountains and could see just in the afternoon smog and the ozone rolling in. You could actually feel it in your breath and the shortness uh, in, in, in your breath just over day. So for all of us, we all have our different reasons and we're extremely passionate about what we're doing, right? And, and, and so that I think is the big driver overall. Yeah, sometimes it is demoralizing. You, you, you kind of get these hits. We, we've been working on problems day in, day out, trying to get things fixed and we're getting hammered and hammered. And sometimes it's not always in our control, it's in someone else's control and we keep pushing and pushing and it does get tiring. But you know, for, for the, the, the few negatives that we get, the thousands of just seamless charging experiences happens and i think people forget that i like to focus on the one or two negative tweets that went through but for that one or one or two negative tweets that went through there was 998 other successful charging sessions that happened within the, you know the same time period um so so that's really what we got to keep in perspective um you know if negative things are going to happen that's fine we have the systems, we have the, the 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 processes, we have everything in place to kind of work those problems. 
and push it forward. And that's really what we try to stay focused on is all all the positives and and, and the real good things we're driving. Uh, you know, we're doing across the, the country. You know, look at how many drives Kyle has done across the country, right? His, his world record run with his Porsche. You know, Tom, you're all over the place trying to you know do zero to hundred, see if he can hit three fifty. You know, on, on specific cars. None of that would be possible. To, like if Electrify America ex didn't exist today, all the good work that everyone in this team has done didn't exist, none of that would be here. You'd be talking about a completely different problem, right? And you have all these great cars, but you can't go anywhere in them, right? <laughs> right. And that would be the issue that we we're dealing with. And, and so we're, we're beyond that now, right? And, and, and we're in such a different place. And so that's what we really try to tell our staff is just think about all the good, all the hard work that we were here today. You know, now I can get in my electric car. I go camping, you know, six hours away, eight hours away. Um, it, it's fantastic. It's something that we couldn't do just a few years ago. And so, you know, that's that's really where we try to focus everyone. But again, Electrify America, everyone on this team is just fantastic, just mission driven. Um, you know, and it's OK. You can tell us where we fail. That we have no problem with that. Just keep it to facts. What happened? What was the issue? And and be rest assured, there's dozens of people that are on it and 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 working the problems and making the industry better. That's great. You know, we're we're up against the hour now, so we're going to have to um, let Robert go. We could talk to you for all day. You know, this is this has been really great. We appreciate you coming on. But I have a bit of a selfish question um, <laughs> for me and Kyle in particular. You know how the station times out every 60 seconds and it just goes to Electrify America screen? You know, Kyle and I do these charging test recordings. We have to stand in front of the station sometimes for an hour and a half. And every 60 seconds, we have to push that button to refresh the screen. Uh -huh. And it is maddening. And um, of course, always about 10 minutes in, I have to go to I have to go to restroom, but I can't now because I can't leave that station. And I know this is a very small use case. But could, could there be something linked to my app and Kyle's app <laughs> that when we Come initiate on. a charging session, that screen doesn't blank out every 60 seconds? Because I tell you, Rob, it is maddening. <laughs> Talk to the developers for us, please. I, I will. I'll take that. But the good news is we're actually going through uh, sort of an update on our HMI screens. Uh, so we're looking at all the use cases. We're we're trying to get a, a better assessment of what customers like and don't like. So I'll certainly take that one back in. Maybe there's like a secret mode where you hit like two different exactly. on the screen and, and it's yeah, just that's what I build. want. Yeah, like a cheat code. Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume it's there for to prevent burn in, you know, on the screen. You know, I yeah. would imagine that's why it, it flips. So I'd imagine it might be something you couldn't deal with. But I tell you, <laughs> stand there for an hour and a half, and every sixty seconds, push that button. Like by the end, your fingers bleeding. <sighs> it's if it's in the middle of the winter, you're a, a frozen block of ice. But you know, we've got to we've got to present this to our readers. They want to see the charging recordings. Well, All right. Thanks for coming on. We'll take we'll take a close look at that. Now, I appreciate it. Thanks for the time, guys. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you for, from all of us for for being on the show. And I guess that brings us to the end of today's bonus episode. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside Eves Forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. If you're watching this on YouTube, and don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Malogny at Tomalog. With, that's with two M's. Martin Lee is at Even News Daily. Uh, I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Electrify America is at Electrify AM, I believe. Electrify underscore Electrify AM. Electrify Right. Okay. Uh, click subscribe, tap that bell icon <laughs> for notifications, and we'll have another midweek. We'll be here on Friday morning as usual, but I think we'll also have another show with another uh, network on next Monday. Um, next Monday might not happen, Tom. We might push it two weeks from now. I'm still. Okay. confirming that okay but well, we're, well the goal is to do these on mondays but sometimes our guests need to move next monday is president's day so we we may skip a week and kyle connor chimes in to say ea customer service is awesome which i've heard from uh, different kyle. people <laughs> uh so yeah click subscribe tap that bell icon for notifications and we'll see you all again next time ciao thanks